So today is a, another episode of the Money Button Documentation Series, and today we're going to cover hierarchical deterministic keys, aka BIP32. So what is that? What is it all about? How does this work? And, and so on. So this time I, I actually have a presentation because I wanted to make sure that this is like conceptually clear. So what I'm going to do is let me share my screen right now. And you guys just let me know if this is actually working. I'll share my entire screen. My computer might also overheat, I, I've, which I've noticed sometimes happens when I do this. So if something starts to go wrong, please just let me know. Um, but anyway, I'm going to go into normal. You should see it. I think you guys see it right now, right? You see my screen and I'm going to yeah. go into presentation mode, which will blink everything for me. And then I'll just sort of give the presentation. Yes. Okay. Okay, great. So uh, basically, first of all, uh, the easiest way to have a wallet would be basically have a single address, which would be a private key, a public key and an address. And you could send and receive all of your money with a single address. And there are wallets that do this. For instance, the yours.org wallet works this way. Each user has a single address. And we did it that way because it's technically easier to do. It solves a bunch of technical problems. But there's one giant problem with this, which is that you have no privacy at all. All of your transactions are on the blockchain with the same address. So anybody that sends money to you now knows what your address is. And they can see all money coming into and out of that same address. So the privacy properties are very poor with this. It does have one good property though, which is it's easy to back up. So from a user experience perspective, it's convenient that you back up a single key. Now, early on in the history of Bitcoin, if you look at how the original code worked, you would download this giant monolithic application called Bitcoin, and it would generate new addresses each time you wanted to receive money, or each time you sent money, it would send money back to a new change address. So it adopted this philosophy of a bag of keys, which is just each time you need a new address, you generate a random new address. And so this has much better privacy properties because you're always receiving money at new addresses. So just because someone sends you money doesn't mean they have any idea like what other addresses you have. So they don't know how much money you have or anything like that. Uh, so the privacy is better. It had one important con though, which was that it's, it's a lot more difficult to back it up because each time you generate a new key, you have to then back up your wallet. And actually in the very early days of Bitcoin, there were people that actually lost money that way where they didn't realize that they had to back up their wallet every single time they sent or received money and they would actually lose money. Uh, and so early on, Bitcoin added a sort of advanced bag of keys, which was instead of just generating a new address each time you needed one, it would generate a hundred in advance so that you could back up your wallet, roughly speaking, every hundred addresses that you would use. Uh, that's still not very good. And you would have to back up this, this sort of encrypted data file and, and so on. So that was, that was sort of the, the first solution. Now, what we, what we ideally want is ideally we would have one master key that you back up and you don't have to constantly back up your wallet. Um, but at the same time, we want good privacy where we have new addresses for each new payment. And then it was also nice if there's a way to allow other people to generate new receiving addresses automatically without having to give it to them so that they can generate it on our behalf. And the way moneybutton.com works is that this is an example of something that we do for our users. The user doesn't have to be online and we actually do have the ability to generate new addresses for them even though we don't have their public key. So this is the goal. We want a system that allows us to have keys that have all these properties. One master key, uh, good privacy by using multiple different addresses and the ability for other people to uh, generate new addresses for us uh, without communicating directly to them if we want to. So the solution is something called hierarchical deterministic wallets or hierarchical deterministic keys. And the basic idea is you start with one master key and from that, you can derive these new paths. So you can derive in a, in a sort of tree, and I've, I'm only showing two keys here, but I'll show a few more sort of examples later. And it's actually a tree. You can derive a new key from each key. And so it's a giant tree of keys. And this has one important pro, which is you only have to back up the single master key. And all other keys can then be derived from that one. So there's only one backup. There's one con, and the con is basically that there are a couple of 
there's basically just one security gotcha that you have to be aware of that's different than a, than a bag of keys. And there are still reasons why you might want to use a bag of keys in some circumstances. Uh, but other than that, it satisfies all of the, uh, the, the properties that we're looking for, which is basically it's easy to back it up. You back it up one time. You can generate new addresses for every time you send to receive money uh, and you can also optionally share these uh, uh, a branch in the tree. So I'm going to explain sort of how this works and this will probably clarify uh, part of it. Um, so the basic idea here is let's suppose we have a private key, lowercase p, uh, public key, capital P and a base point G as normal. Like we already understand this from elliptic curves and private keys and public keys and all that. So I'm showing here that the master public key is derived from the private key by P times G. Now let's suppose we have another key pair that we call the chain code. The chain code is capital C equals lowercase c times G. This is something we're actually going to share with other people. Now we can actually multiply any index number times the chain code to get a new value. So n in this case is actually just a number and we can generate new keys by uh, multiplying, actually it's sort of, so, so you can just generate new public keys or new private keys in something called the chain code. Now we have capital P with a prime. What this is, I'm gonna generate new public keys for myself from an index and from the chain code. So I can take in, in is an index, so it could be zero or one or so on. And basically if I multiply in times a chain code and I add that to my private key, I can generate a new private key. And actually there's a slight typo here on the slide. The last lowercase p prime, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, I don't think you can, but I'll explain it in a, in a minute. I'll fix the typo before I update these slides. But basically, whoops, um, the, I can generate a new master public key where I can give this chain code, the public chain code to other people and tell them I want the first one or the second one or so on. And they can simply multiply that by the chain code and add that to my public key to generate a new public key. And meanwhile, I can take my private key and add n times c, the lowercase c, to get a new private key. And the other people have the ability to generate a new public key, and I can generate the new uh, private key. They can't generate the private key, only I can. Uh, but we can generate any number of them because n can be just a number. Uh, and so this satisfies sort of the properties that we're looking for. We have good privacy. Uh, we can generate new addresses by, uh, you know, using this sort of chain code approach. Uh, and uh, we also have the option of sharing a public key with people where they can derive new public keys uh, by multiplying the public chain code uh, times the index number. Um, and a couple more things. We, we want to have the ability to derive this in pads, so like a hierarchy. So, so not just a single chain code, but if I were to derive a key, I want the ability to derive more keys from that one in a tree. So that in this case, we have M, N1, N2, N3. Those should be numbers where I can derive the zeroth key or the first key or the second key. And then from that one derive completely different keys. So one slash two or one slash three or one slash four or one slash one slash two, one slash one slash three, one slash one slash four, whatever. So they can, that gives us a hierarchy. Um, so the properties here is we've got a chain code. It has a public form of the chain code, the private form. The private form goes with the pu private key, public form goes with the public key. Uh, we have the ability to do hardened branches. And basically what this means is if I want to generate, I, I give somebody like a public key and they can derive new public keys for me, I can actually take that one and derive a new branch that they can't derive because that branch is hardened. And the way that works is basically we hash the private key into uh, the chain code. So there's a way to derive this chain code down the paths, which are basically you either hash the public key to get the chain code if I want to share this branch, or I hash the private key to get the chain code if I want it to be hardened. Uh, so in summary here, we have the algorithm for C. Number one, choose C randomly for my master key so that capital C is lowercase c times G. And then for each path, if I want it to be public or not hardened, I derive C 
from the hash of my public key. If I want it to be hardened, I derive C from the hash of my private key. So that because I'm not sharing my private keys with anyone, only I who have the private key can derive the hardened paths and other people do not have the ability to derive the hardened paths. So here's an example. I just derived a uh, master uh, extended private key and master extended public key, which are these super long digits there you can see at the top. And this is, I'm deriving basically the zeroth and the first key and so on. And I only have a, a few examples here because they're, they're so long, it's hard to fit them all on the screen. But you can see M, that's the master one. M slash zero is like the zeroth derivation from the master key and then the first one and so on. And then from the zeroth one, I can derive yet another one. So M slash zero slash zero is another one. And so then I have, uh, and then I have another example. There's, a, there's another typo there. The, the bottom one should be M zero slash zero slash one. And so I can keep deriving in a hierarchy as many slashes as I want to. And we can also do hardened keys where I can make it such that only I have the ability to derive the hardened keys. So that if I were to share my master extended public key with someone, the public version, they wouldn't be able to derive these. Only I can because only I have my private key. And there's sort of this final security gotcha with all this, which is that you shouldn't, as a general rule, share any of your private keys using this strategy, because if you share a single private key, people can actually derive other private keys. So unless you are generating random paths, it's basically a really poor idea to ever share a private key using BIP32. So this is basically the reason why you wouldn't want to use BIP32 if for some reason you need to share private keys, and there are some protocols that require this, you can't use this. So th this is the big gotcha. Other than that, it checks every box we have for, uh, for deterministic keys. So it allows us to have, I'll just sort of go back up here to start. And it allows us to, to check our boxes here, uh, which is one master key that we back up. We have good privacy because we're using separate addresses for each payment. And we have the optional ability to give someone a public key from which they can derive new public keys to which only we have the private key. So that's my little presentation. I'll stop it here. I'll give code examples as well. But before I go into that, uh, let's see here. I'm still screen sharing. Stop screen share. Okay, so that was that was very quick and brief. Uh, uh, and I'll, sh I'll show code, which will probably clarify some of it. But, but do you guys have any comments or questions before I move on to that part of it? Uh, first, the thing related to security. Mm -hmm. like, I, I, I know that with, with the private key, you can find others, basically. But I imagine that you need something else, like the, like the, like the master pool key or something like that, right? It's not that just with the private key you can derive others. Well, you need the private key and the chain code, and you need to know what paths you're deriving. Uh, cool. So if you do something where, like, if I go back in uh, here, I'll just sort of look at my presentation for a second here so I can uh, demo this. Um, give me one second here. I'm going to share this in a different form. But if I share, like, if I go here and look at, like, a, a, a master extended private key, let me scroll down here and find one. This is giant master extended private key. This has the chain code in it. So if okay. I were to share this, this gives you basically everything you need to start deriving other keys. So that's uh, what not to do. <laughs> you, you probably should not be sharing your master or, or any of the extended private keys because people could just, if you just use this arithmetic, like, uh, here, let me find an example in the math here, but you can just subtract. So points you can't subtract, like I can't do like capital C minus capital P or something like that. But the numbers I certainly can. I can subtract, like if I have this number, I can just say little p minus, you know, some other number or whatever. It's just a number. I can easily subtract them. So then people can generate the other private keys. So that's why it's a, it's a bad idea to ever share the private ones. Wasn't a famous hack where they get the main private key and they just uh, get access to all the private and public keys and they withdraw yes. a bunch, a bunch of uh, amount of money. Yes. So that is uh, sort of that. That is a, a, a. It's either an up or a down depending on how you look at it. Because the fact that you can back up your key or all of your keys in a single piece of data, which is the master key, that's what allows you to back it up. But at the same time, that's what allows anyone who hacks you to actually access all of your money. If there's only one key, 
yes, it's easy to back up, but it also means there's exactly one weak point in the whole system, which means if anybody gets that key, they can spend all of your money. So that is true. And so that's why we have things like either multi-sig or threshold signatures solve that problem. So there are other ways to solve that, which is you basically get rid of that single point of failure. So thresholds, and that's a, we deserve a whole other uh, presentation, of course, but but yes, that is sort of a a flaw, so to speak. It's either an up or a down, depending on how you look at it. Uh, but yes, somebody who has that can spend all your money. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just, just a little, uh, a little no, actually, probably it's going to be easier with, with the code, this, but related to the complexity in, in time for deriving these keys. Like, this is quick, this is too much load for a computer, or? Yeah, good question. So, so the complexity in time is not really any harder than normal like key derivation. So deriving a new public key, basically the only thing that's different is there's a, there's a hash function in there. It uses SHA-512 HMAC to derive these chain codes, but HMAC is actually way faster than point multiplication. So the, the slowest part basically is just deriving a public key from a private key. So now each, each path you have, like m slash zero slash one slash two or whatever, each path involves a new point multiplication. So that's the slow point. So the more branches you have, it starts getting slower, but deriving a large number like m slash two is no harder than m slash one. It's the same hardness. There's one point multiplication. Um, but each slash you have basically is what ratchets up the difficulty. So for the most part, it goes very quickly. Uh, and only if you're using a spectacularly large number of paths or like slashes would, would you actually have to worry about that. Cool. Awesome. Okay, great. So let's let's go look at the code and I'll, I'll uh, demo this, uh, how to actually do this in the library here. Okay, so as usual, I'm in my terminal, I'll open up node and say, you know, load BSV, the library first. Now we have these classes called HD private key. So it's BS, uh, BSV dot HD private key and BSV dot HD public key. So I'll just make a new one real quick. And we'll talk about mnemonics later because I'm not showing anything about how the mnemonics work because normally you would have a mnemonic. And before Oihe asked, because I know you would ask something like this, uh, what is the mnemonic? It would look, you know, normally you would have like a string, uh, which would be like word, 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 a bunch of words or whatever. And we'd use that to derive a key. So I'm not doing that just because we'll, we'll give that in another presentation. Uh, but let's suppose I just want to generate a new one randomly. I would say bsb.hd private key dot from random. And this generates a new Okay, HD private key, HD private key. I'm not sure if I, this might have the old version where I don't have, uh, let me let me do it differently. Var HD private key equals BSV dot, here I'll say new BSV dot HD private key. Pretty sure this version will work. HD private key dot choose string. Okay, now I've generated a new random uh, private key. Uh, master extended private key. So this includes, I'll, I'll just show this, what it has in here. Um, let's see here. Can I do dot two object? I think they have some of these in here. Um, okay, good. So if I do the two object, it, it gives us a bit of the extra data in here. And you can see things like there is a private key and there is a chain code. And the chain code is just a number um, in addition to the private key. So that's basically it. There are a few other things that have to do with the way it's formatted and the index and so on. Um, but it's basically those things, private key, chain code, and index, uh, and then some other data, like this is just basically writing it as a string. So when we write as a, as a string, like most things, uh, it is a, a base 58 check encoded string. So when we output, what does this look like? So if I wanted to just back this up, I would back up this string right here. This is the string form of my, of my key. Now they always start with, very carefully chosen letters, XPRV is short for extended private key. So a lot of the time you'll see like, if you have a variable, you might call it XPRIV. That's just a shorthand way of describing what is an extended private key. Now I can do this. I can say extended public key equals bsv.hd public key dot from hd private key. 
HD private key. Don't, I feel like I'm using the wrong version of this library or something because now I, let's see here. I'll have to do, here, I'll have to do it differently. HD public key equals B, I'll say new H, BSV dot HD public key. I think this version of this will work. HD private key. So the functions that I'm used to using aren't exposed. I, I might have, I thought I exposed those, but maybe I didn't. In any case, now I've generated my uh, HD public key here. Now this one is, it is that private key, but in the public form. So this one's, this one is also kind of interesting. So let's do the two object just to look inside of it. I hope they have that available. Yes, they do. So this one also has the chain code and a public key. So that's basically all it is, along with the index is that in value, which is like, which, which one is it? So here's the interesting thing. So let's say take my private key dot derive child is what this is called. And now I can do this. I can derive a new one. So I'll derive say M slash zero would be like the first one there. And I'll say that two string just for good measure here. So HD private key dot two string is ought to be different. So this is like the zeroth one. So I can now derive, say, the first one and so on. And I have, I can derive as many of these as I want to, well, up to about 2 billion. So the maximum number would be something like 2e to the 9, uh, because it's the maximum sized 31-bit integer, because the other bit is used to indicate whether it's hardened or not. So what that means is basically, if I want to derive a private key that you can't have the public key from, I put a prime in there. And then it's a requirement that I have the, the uh, uh, private key. So what that means in practice is starting from my private key, I derive the zeroth one. I can then take my public key and I can also derive the zeroth public key from the public key. So if I were to share HD public key with someone, they can derive the corresponding public key here. Uh, from the master extended public key that I share with them. They can't generate the private one, but they can share the public one. Now, let's suppose I generate the hardened uh, version of this, m slash zero prime. Now I want to generate the corresponding public hardened key. I can't do it because it involves hashing the private key, which anyone with the public key doesn't have. So you just can't do it. Um, and then we can dive into this a little bit more and see things like, Look at this. I'll look at the private key inside of this. So in HD private key, I can print out what's the private key, and I can print out what is the public key as well. Oops. There we go. So I'm taking my, my master key here and deriving my private key and public key as they would normally be printed out. Using the public key, I can do the same thing. So I can do things like HD public key dot public key dot two string. What I can't do, of course, is the public key does not have the private key and it can't access it. So if I try to do this, that doesn't work. So what I can do is I can share this, uh, you know, the, the, the key here. And this gives other people the ability to derive public keys on my behalf. This matters because, of course, this is exactly what we're doing inside Money Button. So Money Button does not have anybody's private keys. What we have is we have your master extended public key which we can use to derive new public keys for you, which we then use to derive new addresses for you. So that way, when somebody sends money to you, you don't have to be online or something like that. We can generate a new address. In fact, just, for, just to sort of close the loop here, if I have one of these things, I'll say something like var public key equals hd public key dot pub, public key. I can say generate a new address equals bsv.address.from public key, public key, address dot two string. So by sharing somebody's extended public key, they can generate new addresses uh, for, uh, for you. So that's basically it. This is how we're, the, the user is basically backing up, backing up their extended private key, except they're backing up in the form of a mnemonic. And we'll get to that in a different video, but the mnemonic is actually used to derive the master extended private key which is then used to derive all these other things. So the user can derive their own private keys. So we can do things like money button generates a new address for the user. We know that it's index number seven. 
So when the user gets back online again and they actually want to spend that money, they derive private key number seven that corresponds to that address. So we never had the private key. Only the user has a private key. Um, so I think that's it. Um, any comments or questions about that stuff? Uh, I remember you said, uh, but what is the, what's the M stands for? Like all the paths start with M slash something and slash something. So I, I, it's just a convention and I, I think it just means master key. So it's just like every path always starts with M slash. And I assume it just means master key. That might be something that's in the BIP32 spec. Um, let me just sort of look that up real quick. We probably won't read the spec or something like that, but I'll just show this on my screen so that people can see it. And I'd recommend reading it. Like basically, if you're, if you're someone that's actually creating a wallet, you should probably read the spec. It's, if you understand this video, you're gonna understand the spec just fine. The spec does a, a, gives a few more details about how to format things, but it's everything I said in this video is what the spec is. Um, so somewhere in here, it probably says that. I'm scanning for paths. I don't see it right now. I can, I can see this. So they might say in there, why does it start with an M? But it's just kind of a convention. It always starts with an M. Uh, one other thing I want to say before I forget. So BIP32 is not the only way to derive uh, sort of deterministic keys. Uh, there is uh, at least one other way that's widely used, which is the way that Electrum does it. Electrum has a different sort of default key derivation strategy. Uh, most other wallets use BIP32. So in the Bitcoin SV world, to the best of my knowledge, uh, Handcash, CentB, and CashPay, and MoneyButton um, all do it the same way, which is, which is BIP32. And Electrum is kind of the exception in that, that their default way of doing it is different. Although Electrum does have the ability to read uh, this key structure and they can import, you know, money button wallets and stuff like that into Electrum. Um, so they actually have to support multiple. Um, but yeah, okay. So maybe what I can do next is let me show the, the documentation. I don't want to show that. Well, actually, maybe I'll briefly show the source code. It, I, I don't want to go through it in detail just because this one has got some really, really... Uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, unreadable code. <laughs> so it doesn't answer very much to look at the code, but I, I'll do it anyway and just glance at it so that people can see it out of sheer curiosity here. Um, let's see here. There's the source code. Okay. I'll just do this really quickly. It's quite long. A lot of this has to do with formatting stuff differently. And so there's an HD a private key and HD public key. And so there are two different classes is how they have this broken up here. And it's, it's everything I said in the video, plus a bunch of formatting and different ways to access things and things like that. So it's difficult to read, but it isn't really any more complicated than what I said in that, in that presentation. That's basically all it is. And there are some standardized test vectors that are run on all this stuff so that one other piece of information here, um, Bit BitPay made like a minor error at one point in their implementation of this. And they had this der derivation path was actually wrong. And they were doing something where they derived, when they were writing down the private keys, if the private key started with a zero, they actually wrote down only 31 bytes for the private key instead of 32. They didn't maintain the size of 32 bytes. And that led to, like, it wasn't really a security problem, but what it meant was one out of 256 addresses on average could not be imported into other wallet software. So it was like a really irritating difference that was just on accident. And so they ended up deprecating this. I just changed the code yesterday that we now throw an error if somebody calls this. They already have this other one in here called derive non compliant key or here, I think it's in this one here. I'll, I'll just search it real quick. Derive non-compliant uh, key. So if someone watches this and they download the new version of BSV and it breaks for them, you should just switch to this version of the method so that you know whether you're using the, uh, the sort of the non-standard form of this method. And what we're doing inside Money Button is derive child. So this is the one you should use just because this is the one that's actually compliant with the BIP32 spec because we actually had a line of code in our code base that was using this one, that on a public key, it's the same, but on a private key, it's different. 
So just, just anybody watching this, be aware of that. The way to derive it is with the derived child method and BitPay is the one that named it this way and all this. So it's pretty clear that this is not the one that you wanna use normally uh, because it's non-compliant. And only if you're already doing it that way uh, should you keep doing it that way. Otherwise you should do it using the derived child method. Uh, so that's just kind of a, a technical uh, uh, detail there. Um, okay, let me quickly look at the uh, uh, documentation as well. So we now have documentation for BIP32. And this is what we are doing uh, inside Money Button. We use BIP32. And again, we have a, a bit of a description of the theory here in the HD private keys section that explains basically what's going on here with this math and the chain codes and all that stuff. And then a different one for public keys so that you know how to access each, each of these things separately. So how to generate new private keys and public keys and so on and derive new keys from those and new addresses and everything. And then the only other missing piece here will be, we'll have a, a different video on mnemonics where we cover the final piece. What is a mnemonic and how do we get to all these keys and addresses from a mnemonic? So any other comments or questions, guys? Mm, not, not from my side of this. No, I think what I said. Okay. All right, good. Um, okay, then uh, then that's it for, for this one. There's only one video. So between HD public keys and HD private keys, it'll just be this one video. And then we'll do mnemonics next. And that will fully explain what a wallet is basically uh, when, when we cover that video. So, all right, well, thank you everyone. Oh, oh let me, uh, I almost forgot. Uh, well, uh, anyone watching this, you can see links to all of this documentation stuff at moneybutton.com. Uh, and you can see the documentation itself at docs.moneybutton.com. If you want to talk with us or get help with any of this stuff, please visit our Telegram group at t.me slash moneybuttonhelp. And we're also creating blog posts out of all of this material. So you can see these blog posts as well as any of the other blog posts that we have at blog.moneybutton.com. Uh, so if you forget any of that, just go to moneybutton.com where you can find everything. All right, that's it uh, for today. So thanks uh, for listening, everybody.